My goal for this video is to condense two months worth of study down to 15 minutes to tell you everything you need to know about the back. The most common entries, control, and of course the rear naked choke. So let's dive in. Shh. When talking about the back, we want to control our opponent at the upper body and lower body to align ourselves with them. Now from turtle, you often already have upper body control and you're looking to gain lower body control. And probably the most reliable way to do this is with a two-on-one leg method. In my opinion, the single best method of doing this is the two-on-one leg method. Now, a lot of times when your opponent defends these two-on-one leg methods from turtle, they're gonna roll over their far shoulder. And ideally, you're able to follow through and take the back the way Lachlan shows here. I'm putting my knee behind the back. My top leg's trying to collect that leg to curl in and take it over the top. But the problem with doing this technique is the one hook that you have is shallow. So it's relatively easy for them to clear that hook and you end up in this position here where you have a seatbelt but no lower body control. And this position comes up a lot when your back take is initiated from turtle, side control, crab ride, half guard, where you have a good chest to back connection but no lower body control. And you'll notice that mount is not on this list because when you take the back from mount, you often do so with at least one hook in place or even a body triangle. So one of the beautiful qualities about the back is that there are so many ways to get there. It doesn't matter where you are on the mat, you are at most one move away from taking your opponent's back. But when we're trying to take the back from positions other than mount, it can be hard to insert our lower body and upper body at the same time. So one option would be to double down on controlling the legs using things like the truck. And then from there, working up to establish control at the upper body. But what happens more often than not is our opponent's able to clear our lower body control. But we're able to take upper body control, which would be considered an upgrade. Ultimately, you want both together. But if you have to go for a choice between one or the other, go with this one. So there are a lot of ways to the back, but most of the time you're gonna to have to go through a position like this. It's really important that you understand what to do from the overhook side and the underhook side when you don't have any hooks. And what we're gonna do is double down on our seatbelt while we work to establish our hooks. Now, one very common escape for our opponent is for them to turn towards turtle. And if we're on the underhook side and they turn away from us, we end up in turtle with a seatbelt, but our underhook is on the near side. The seatbelt on this side, you can see I basically losing all my all my chest to back uh, connection. Now, ideally we're able to just switch our seatbelt and maintain control, but more often than not, our opponent is gonna be long gone before we do that. But if we're on the overhook side and our opponent turns towards their knees, we just have a standard seatbelt from Turtle and we're able to continue our attacks. Or even better from the overhook side, we can prevent their turn completely because we have this underhook. Now, if our underhook is on the bottom, we don't have the same luxury of preventing the turn. And the general advice is to try and keep your elbow heavy. If my opponent tries to turn to the lift, it's my elbow here and his shoulder that makes it difficult for him. But the problem is as our opponent's shoulder is turning away from us, it brings our elbow farther and farther away from our hip. One of the strongest structures in the human body is the connection of my elbow to my own hip. So just from a body mechanic standpoint, it's hard for us to keep a heavy elbow on the shoulder to prevent the turn. And once they get to turtle, our seatbelt's on the wrong side, so they're most likely gonna escape. So if you have no hooks and just a seatbelt, generally it's preferred to be on the overhook side. With my underhook down, and no hooks right now, it's probably the worst spot I could be while having a seatbelt. So if we're trying something like a wedging back take and we're not able to fully take the back, but we're able to get a seatbelt, that would be considered an upgrade. And if we're on the overhook side, even better. Because from here, we can start looking to throw in our top hook, chair sit, and take the back. But a savvy defender is gonna find a way to force the underhook side with no hooks. So from the overhook side, maybe they turtle quickly and roll through. And as we follow the roll, the defender is disciplined with their elbow position and prevent our hook from coming in. So now we've downgraded and we know it's risky to hang out on the underhook side with no hooks. So we quickly sit our opponent up and work to insert our hooks from here. Now the question becomes, should we try and insert our hook on the underhook side or the overhook side? And from this kneeling position, my observation has been that it's hard to insert your hook on the underhook side. However, if you're seated with them already in between your knees, and especially if you have a Kimura grip, it can be easier to slide your foot in from the underhook side. But that puts us in an interesting position because now we're on the underhook side with our bottom hook in and our feet crossed in what the Danaher crew calls a high ball ride. And from a high ball ride on the underhook side, 
You control your opponent very well on one side of their body, but the only thing stopping them from turning to their knees is your elbow position. And like we talked about previously, more often than not, they're gonna be able to turn to turtle. The other huge downside to being on the underhook side is your opponent can use their top arm to deny your second hook, but they don't have the same luxury from the overhook side. Or on the underhook side, her primary hand is the hand that's being used to deal with my strangle hand, and her free hand to push in my knee is that was secondary hand. So all she needs is a half a second, push my knee off, move, to, move into a turtle, and start to go towards uh, her escape here. So if you have a high ball ride from the underhook side, your opponent's probably gonna be able to turn towards their knees. And if you're able to stay in control and recapture the back, but now you're on the overhook side with a high ball ride, I would consider that an upgrade. So from a kneeling position, I think it's easier and more preferred to insert your first hook on the side of your overhook before locking that bottom hook in place and securing a high ball ride. Now it's really important that we cross our feet because the defender is gonna be looking to hook behind our ankle and clear our hook. And if we're feeling a bit fancy, we can leave our feet uncrossed, baiting our opponent to try and hook behind our ankle. And when they do, we can now cross our feet, trapping their ankle inside the party, which we see Big Dan doing here as well, so it seems to be a new wave thing and makes it very difficult for the defender to bring their top knee to their chest, which opens up space for us to insert our top hook. The shit's chest, it ain't checkers. Now, if we just try and insert a standard hook, it can be relatively easy for the defender to clear it. So generally what we're looking to do is stomp on their thigh and cut our bottom hook all the way across to the top hip. So we can lock a body triangle and secure the back. I feel like the chance of going like two hooks is lower than the chance of me stepping the leg, pushing it, and chopping my right leg across. Now that we've taken the back, our opponent is gonna be trying to escape. And they can do that by first fighting our hooks and creating misalignment at the lower body. Or they can escape by first creating misalignment at the upper body. And if we had a choice, we'd prioritize upper body control. It's much harder to recover from this situation than it is than this situation. Now when controlling at the lower body, ideally we have a body triangle and we can lock it on top, on bottom, or a third option that I've found very valuable to have in my back pocket. Now if we have a bottom side body triangle, our opponent is gonna have the ability to get their back down towards the mat. Placido can actually turn his hips quite a long way and square up his body to the ceiling. Let's contrast this with a top side body triangle, where now it's gonna be hard for our opponent to get their back to the mat, but they can turn away from us towards turtle. So if we have our body triangle locked on top, we can expect our opponent to be turning away from us. And if we feel threatened by this escape, it's probably a good time to switch to a bottom body triangle. That body triangle is a huge wedge underneath the hips, and it makes rotation in that direction exceedingly difficult. Now the third type of triangle is going to be a side body triangle where we hook our opponent's leg. I don't know, I let go of my arms. He tries to turn towards me. It's really difficult to do. I just extend my leg into his leg. Okay. All right, so. Uh, without that, he could keep, I keep turning towards me, he could spin out, right? So as we're trying to insert our top hook and lock a body triangle, if our opponent's trying to get their back to the mat, it's a good time to use this side body triangle variation. And then when they relax, it can be a good time to switch to a more traditional triangle. Now, when it comes to controlling at the upper body, our opponent is going to be trying to bring both of our arms to the same side of their body. And if they can do that, we can no longer strangle them as they work to get their back to the mat and escape. And this technique is most effective when done from the overhook side. However, if this happens and we're on the underhook side, it's not the end of the world. So if we're on the underhook side, what our opponent's likely going to do is try and bring both of our arms to the same side of their body and then switch sides to put themselves on the overhook side this is the same position as when we elbow passed from the overhook side. So now they can work to get their back to the mat. And if we have a bottom side body triangle, it's gonna be relatively easy for them to do so and they're likely gonna escape. So if this happens on the underhook side, it's not the end of the world, but we have to make sure they cannot switch sides. And we can make this difficult for them by using our top leg or shooting our hips out and concaving our spine to widen our base in that direction. Concave my body and I, I push my, ass out behind me so it stops him from bridging over to the far side here. So my takeaway from this is that from the underhook side you can be a bit more cavalier with your upper body position. But on the overhook side when things go south they go south quick. So threatening a rear naked choke from the overhook side can be a lot more risky. And now you've lost control of the upper body with a bottom side body triangle. And it's going to be very hard for you to prevent your opponent from getting their back to the mat to escape. Which is why I think Lachlan is pretty spot on with this statement. 
So my underhook can prevent him sliding out down towards the ground and freeing his shoulders. And I can kind of spam my attacks with my, my choking arm. If I was to have the choking arm down and I'm trying to spam, I'm giving a good chance for him to control the arm and take it to the other side. So when trying to finish a rear naked choke, we can do so from the underhook side, the overhook side, or double overhooks. And when looking at the data I have, the overhook side does have the most finishes, but it's relatively close. And from the overhook side, it's gonna be hard to get under the chin, and you're most likely gonna use a mandible finish, which tend to be a bit more opportunistic and mean compared to the underhook side where you're much more likely to get under the chin for a clean rear naked choke. Okay, on the overhook side, we can't bring our elbow back, it runs into the ground. From the underhook side, I can bring my elbow much further back and start getting into that crease behind the ear to get in a clean strangle. And if you're trying to finish with double overhooks, it's pretty much split down the middle. Now, if you are able to use double overhooks, it seems to me like the best way to get under the chin is to use the hidden hand method. We go underneath our own arm and we create a hidden hand around our training partner's neck. It seems to be a very reliable way to get underneath the chin. And to be honest, it's pretty satisfying because it tends to be a bit of a slow process and you can feel your opponent getting more and more desperate as your strangle arms getting deeper and deeper. And it tends to be a more friendly way to finish a rear naked choke. But if you can't get that one to work, this next one seems to be the bread and butter where you threaten the strangle with your top arm and look at your opponent's bottom elbow. If he keeps his elbow in close and tries to grab my wrist, look what I can do. I can turn him belly down. And if they elect to go belly down, then they're probably going to get finished. So to prevent themselves from going belly down, they can put out a post, which leads nicely into a gravity drop finish. If he puts out a post, then we put pressure on him, pressure, and then we just drop. So you can play this dilemma from double overhooks, but also from the underhook side, because the requirement is you threaten with your top arm. So my roadmap when finishing from the back is that from the overhook side, you're not gonna be spamming strangles, but you can look for opportunistic mandible finishes. And what this can look like is just finishing a strangle straight from a high ball ride. Or as your opponent's trying to get their back to the mat, you can lock a side body triangle to make that difficult as you work to finish the rear naked choke. But when we're looking to set up attacks against strong resistance, it seems to me like the most reliable attacks start with the threat of a top arm strangle, which you can only do from the underhook side or double overhooks. Now on Instagram and in my YouTube shorts, I'm going to be sharing other little nuances, tricks, and techniques that I found helpful from the back. But the main thing I wanted to build with you in this video is the roadmap. So when you apply these techniques, you can say, okay, my back take failed, but at least it gave me upper back exposure. And if I had a choice between only upper back exposure or only lower back exposure, based on the roadmap, I'd take upper back exposure. So you moved one step closer towards the back and that was energy well spent. If you have no hooks, the underhook side is probably the worst place you could be. So if you're able to sit them up, even if you try and throw in your hook and it fails resulting in turtle, you started in the worst spot you could be. So as long as you're able to maintain the upper back exposure, it was energy well spent. If you go from a high ball ride on the underhook side and you're able to find your way to a high ball ride on the overhook side, that would be another step up the ladder. And maybe after you use the overhook side to successfully take the back, you see an opportunity to switch to the underhook side because that gives us our preferred finishing position where we can threaten the strangle with our top arm to create that belly down dilemma. So nowadays, when I see a technique that jumps right to the end goal, I'm very skeptical. And I'm trying to filter it through the lens of what happens if this fails? Will I be moving closer to my end goal or farther away from it? And because I have this roadmap, I feel like I can more accurately do that. And if you're interested in the tool I use to do all my studying, it's called the Outlier Database, and the link is in the description. And I'll talk to you in the Discord.